Singing Dutchman Productions. Hello and welcome to Doug's Front Porch, a podcast where I get to sit down with friends old and new and have honest conversations. Today, I welcome to the front porch an old friend, a colleague, someone that I really look up to, uh, and I can't wait to talk to this guy, and that's Patrick Dunmoyer. Hello, Patrick, and welcome to the front porch. Hey, Doug. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> well, for people that don't know Patrick, um, and I'm sure there's a lot of listeners out there that don't, uh, Patrick is the director of the Pennsylvania German Cultural Heritage Center at Kutztown University, and we'll talk more about that uh, later on in the interview. But my connection to Patrick is through uh, the work that I do and that he does uh, for Pennsylvania Dutch culture, language, history, heritage, preservation, and and what we're all doing in in you know, in the internet these days and social media. And I've been known Patrick now for quite a while. And I really um, am glad that we have a professional relationship and also a, a friendship too. So Patrick, I want to talk a little bit, let's go to the beginning. Tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, where you grew up. Um, what was your childhood like? Did you grow up agricultural? Was it just, I'll shut up now. Tell us a little bit. <laughs> Oh, sure. All right. Well, I'm originally from Lebanon County. I lived right in Lebanon City and went to Lebanon City schools. I lived in Lebanon until I was almost eight. And um, I grew up uh, in a quiet, quiet part of town. And uh, my my parents and uh, and I lived on Chestnut Street. My great grandmother lived right around the corner, and uh, she lived in an old Victorian row home. And some of my earliest memories are there. And uh, it was great to me growing up having some strong Pennsylvania Dutch roots within my family. Um, most of my family had formerly been uh, agricultural families that had been from northern Lebanon and other areas. My great grandmother's family, actually, that I mentioned living on Second Street, she was from the Reading area and her parents were. And uh, it's interesting, within just a couple generations within my family, folks had moved from the farms into the city in order to work for Bethlehem Steel. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it changed, uh, changed the family a lot in a lot of ways. Um, most of my grandparents have memories associated with uh, having lived out in the country. Um, I still have one of my grandmothers who is is living and uh, she remembers helping out as a child on the family farm and uh, my parents generation was really I think the first generation that didn't kind of have that connection and that knowledge of like that there's a family farm out there somewhere okay uh, yeah so, so I, we were definitely not an agricultural family growing up at least in my in my immediate family I have one right but the, the and, DNA, uh, the DNA was yeah. there though sure, <laughs> somewhere sure, absolutely. <laughs> So you graduate high school and then you uh, decide to go to Kutztown University. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your time there as an undergraduate. Did you what what is your degree in first off? Well, my degree is an art degree, and I have two of those, actually, one that is in studio art, the other that was in fine craft with a concentration in uh, fibers. And that was because at one point in time, I uh, restored historic looms and um I uh, I also have a minor in Pennsylvania German studies from Kutztown. So when you, as a freshman coming into Kutztown, was was were you already declared an art major, or is that something you decided and you know you you came to that decision in your academic journey? Oh, I knew that from the moment I got there. Um, <laughs> my mother jokes with me and says, "You just went to Kutztown because uh, they." because they teach Pennsylvania Dutch there. And the funny thing was, she said that to me, she must have been looking very closely at the course catalog. And I, on the other hand, uh, uh, was not. Uh, so I didn't realize that that was there. And I, I heard her say that and thought, oh my gosh, they actually teach uh, Pennsylvania Dutch. And so that just clinched the deal for me in some ways. But uh, interestingly enough, um, I had gone to Kutztown from York County because I spent my high school actually in York County where almost nobody spoke any Dutch. Uh -huh. um, some of the very oldest people did, but moving to the Kutztown area reminded me of my Lebanon County roots. And so it was a really nice thing to go to there and, uh, get immersed in the town and the school at the same time. Sure. Yeah. Um, so you, 
you know, you go through your studies there, you pick up all this Pennsylvania Dutch stuff along the way, as, as well as all of your art. Um, mm-hmm. At what point and how do you first get involved with the Cultural Heritage Center? Well, it was it was a couple different ways. Um, on one one hand, uh, it was, I think, spring of 2006, I want to say. I started taking uh, the Pennsylvania German language class with Ed Quinter, who was the professor. It was actually the very first year they taught the class. And I was a, one of the first students in that class. And I was, I was really delighted to be able to, uh, um, to take that class. And part of it was held at the Heritage Center. Um, the other part of um, why I spent some time at the center was I was studying fibers, um, primarily weaving. And uh, I was told they had a historic loom at the Heritage Center and um, that it needed some rehabbing. So I worked with a fellow student and uh, we worked on this big old frame loom from the 1820s to 1830. We got about halfway done with it and I wanted to stay on and keep working after the semester was over. And so I ended up uh, starting kind of some independent work there, working on this historic loom, got it working. And they basically said, hey, we, we like your style. We'd love to have you work on some other things here. And I said, well, that would be great. And uh, so that was kind of part of what launched it. Okay. Um, the other thing that launched it as well was at the very same time, I, I got very interested in the subject of powwowing. This was something I had heard a lot about from my Lebanon County relatives and something I also learned a great deal about when I lived in the York County area. And so that was another um, thing that kind of clinched the deal of why I, I really got immersed in the culture. Um, on so hand, real language qu- fed into that as well. Mm-hmm. Real quick for our listeners that maybe don't have a background in Pennsylvania Dutch, you brought up the word powwowing. Can we sure. give them a, a real quick uh, or like a definition of what is pow? You, we hear that term. What 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 is that? Powwowing is a ritual healing tradition. This is something that is over three centuries old that's been passed down by word of mouth among Pennsylvania Dutch people, but also a broad range of other people who live in the areas. The term powwowing is somewhat of a um, it's somewhat of a, a, a point of controversy because the practice itself is actually coming right out of the Rhine River Valley in Germany and something that would have been held in common by people all across Central Europe. These are old traditions that would have involved the use of blessings and um, many different forms of rituals for the purpose of healing and protecting people. Some of these come from Roman Catholic roots, some come from ancient roots, but when it got here to Pennsylvania, to the rest of the Pennsylvania community, this practice seems so exotic, especially to speakers of English, that they refer to this as powwowing because they thought it had something in common with Native American traditions. And the earliest uh, recording we have of that particular term being used to describe this practice is from the 1790s in Maiden Creek, Maiden Creek Township, Berks County. Uh, so it's a really fascinating thing. Yeah. And okay. something that many people today, of course, even though this is a really old, old tradition, um, many people today still have memories about this. If you talk to folks in Berks County and you ask a room full of people who are over the age of 60, how many of you know what powwowing is? If it's rural Berks County, probably about 85 percent of those people will know. If you ask how many of you were powwowed as children, you might get 50 percent of the room. Yeah. Um, and I know I've done this um, while speaking to large groups of people in the area. And this is something, too. My grandparents told me a lot about this growing up, and so it was something that was interesting to me and something I had the opportunity to learn a little bit about in the Kutztown area. Awesome. Awesome. So now you are the director of the center. Um, let's tell the listeners a little bit about, you know, what is this? What is the Pennsylvania German Cultural Heritage Center? What does it look like if I came to visit? What would I see? That type of stuff. Okay, well, the Heritage Center is an open air folk life museum situated on a 19th century farmstead. We have a barn from 1855, a one room schoolhouse from 1871, and an 1814 farmhouse, and a wide variety of other buildings. Um, So on one hand, you've got the original farmstead, and you've got the opportunity to experience these spaces. We have a museum in the house and also in the schoolhouse. Um, We have all the different spaces that are outfitted to acquaint people locally with different traditions, emphasizing domestic traditions, agricultural traditions, and education within the region. 
And uh, we've also got a research library and we do many different things for public outreach, being part of Pennsylvania German language events throughout the region, um, as well as running a publication series, helping with centralizing a calendar and coordinating events across many different counties and publicizing those events so that people are aware of how they can get involved with these traditions um, that are so specific to our area. We also have um, events that we hold throughout the year. Of course, those events aren't happening right now due to the pandemic, but normally we would be getting ready for a Christmas on the farm event, which normally brings out around 1,200 people to the farm. Folks are especially interested in the different um, aspects of what makes our area unique, the music, the arts, the foodways, and especially the old traditions, things that have been passed down by word of mouth over a long period of time that really tend to flavor the area, both with language and then also ways in which the culture is brought into the home and is sustained and nurtured within our communities. I want to come back to that in a minute, but uh, this has to be really unique that Kutztown University, a state-run university in the, in the state system here in Pennsylvania, has a museum like this on their actual grounds. Is there any other uh, university that you're aware of in, in Pennsylvania or maybe here in the Northeast that has something like what Kutztown has in the center? Not to my knowledge. Um, my understanding is that this is one of the jewels of the Pennsylvania state system of higher education, um, of which Kutztown University is one of 14 schools. Right. I don't know of any other situation. I know, of course, you know, there are many different schools that might have, they might have a farm operation or something like that connected with what they do, or they may coordinate um, agricultural activities. But I don't know of any schools that have a museum that is a living history museum or even a folk life museum like what we have. Now, I, I make a distinction there because living history is really where people dress up and they portray previous time periods. We, on the other hand, are talking about present day culture. We explore the past, but also present day traditions and the way in which we're emphasizing who we are in the present day. So I don't, I don't actually see anything like what we're doing. And part of the reason I think that we have something so unique is because Kutztown is really the epicenter of the folk life movement, really initiated by the scholars who began the Kutztown Folk Festival, which is America's oldest folk life festival. Um, so this was founded in 1950, and it created a lot of momentum for local people to celebrate the local culture, and it had a national appeal. And so our, our Heritage Center was really established um, in the 1990s even, you know, well over 40 years after the Folk Festival was established, but partially due to the momentum in the local area for recognizing the significance of folk culture and why it's important to be able to start preserving and celebrating it as these older generations of people who remember many of these traditions that really make our area unique while we still have those people with us we're not going to wait until it's history we're going to we're going to celebrate it right now while it's still with us and still amongst us right i'm going to play devil's advocate for a second patrick sure. why if it, you know i'm coming out of the woodwork and I, I meet you in the street and i'm going to ask you this question why is it important for us to learn this stuff it's old it's, you know, it's, it's bygone eras. Why is it important for me, Joe Schmo on the street to learn any of this stuff? Well, I'll tell you exactly why. And it's related to this concept that is so popular today. People are talking about FOMO, the fear of missing out. Just wait until you're in your 60s and you're retired and you look back on all the different traditions that were held in your family that you were not interested in because at that point in time, they weren't in vogue and they weren't cool. And then you will look back with a sense of nostalgia for all the things that you missed. And this is something that I encounter all the time for local people within our area who say, you know what? My great grandparents spoke a language other than English. My grandparents spoke Pennsylvania Dutch. And you know what? I could have learned it and I never did. And so on one hand, that is part of the answer for local people. Why get involved? Because if you don't do it now, you're going to wish you did later. The other side of this is that we have this, we have this conundrum as Americans. We have a melting pot and we're all, for the most part, people who came from other areas who settled here um, or came here at different times in our, in our Commonwealth's history. And over time, we've, we've kind of adjusted to one another. And this happens all throughout the United States where folks, of course, are going to be, um, you know, 
coming to the, to the uh, to North America, bringing traditions with them, leaving some traditions behind, picking up new traditions along the way. And this is a constant process. This is something that people are constantly learning new traditions, sharing traditions, changing traditions. And uh, it is one of those things that we have to be somewhat conscious about. Um, if we um, let things go and decide that we're not going to maintain traditions that maybe are things that, that are part of who we are, um, we sometimes will find ourselves in a position where we say, wow, you know what? I don't know what makes me different from other people. I don't know what makes my community unique. Here we've got this community and we know when we, we were necessarily, we might know where we were when we were established. We might know um, things about our history, but we might not know a whole lot about what the, uh, um, the people and generations before were doing. We might not necessarily have a connection to those people in a really strong way. And the ways that we can connect with our more immediate ancestors are through food, through music, through things that were done in the home, associated with holiday seasons. All of these things are irreplaceable. Once they're gone, you can't learn them from books the same way you would learn them if you actually interacted with living people who remember the old songs, who remember the old recipes, who can tell you how to take things from your garden and transform them into wonderful foods that are going to not only nourish your body, but nourish your spirit. Soul food is, is very much a cultural treasure. And so many different aspects of Pennsylvania Dutch culture revolve around language, foodways, farming, domestic traditions, agricultural traditions and again i'll go back to fomo is if you if you don't take the time to become aware of these types of things now one day you're going to wish that you did yeah you're you're exactly right and, and i can echo what what patrick just said doing the work that i do the majority of the emails that i get from people looking for help in regards to pennsylvania dutch stuff is is always the same same scenario. I heard my grandparents speaking the language. I didn't learn it. You know, my parents never passed it on. And they, often they'll say, I feel like part of me is missing. And it's such a strong, it's such a strong feeling. I mean, I, I am, I, I know that I'm blessed that I, that my family's passed these traditions on to, to my generation and my brother, myself and my brother, language, culture, you know, holiday things, recipes, like you talked about, but there are a lot of people out there and we could probably talk about this for any subculture group within the United States. Uh, I, you know, I never heard it referred to as FOMO before, but that really does speak to, um, you know, the, this sense that if, if, of loss and that it is it's it's like you know if we're a puzzle and that one one or two pieces is missing the puzzle can never be fully viewed right absolutely um, and, and and it is I, I try to stress that with my students as well you know in in school I talk to them you know talk to your grandparents have them tell you a story you might not learn everything but learn something you know but pick their brain a little bit. What was it like when they were a kid or what was it like for them going to school, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I agree with you. FOMO is a real thing. And I think because of, of social media and the role that it plays and how everybody now has that, not everybody, but so many people have this sense that they want to port, they, they have an opportunity to portray themselves on a, on a, on a stage, essentially, whether it's Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or, or wherever. And their culture is something that they could be portraying like that. Um, and I would like to see us kind of make that popular or make that in vogue or bring it into in vogue in some form or another. And I think the work that you're doing in places like the center and the folk festival are great opportunities for people to realize, hey, this is actually pretty cool because it does make me a little unique, you know, compared to my friends, maybe or, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, one other thing I think that is important, too, is oftentimes as Americans, we find ourselves in this conundrum that if we don't remember our own family's traditions, if we don't remember the traditions that were unique to our community, we look elsewhere for those traditions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, we sometimes find ourselves um, as Americans in danger of appropriating traditions as a, you know, as a response to lacking traditions or, or perhaps forgetting about the traditions. And so this is, this is an important thing is that um, if we remember the traditions that are part of the communities that we are growing up in, that we are contributing to, um, we have a real strong connection to those things, or at least we can forge strong connections with those. Yeah. It's up to us. It's up to us how we do that.
Right. No, I agree. So we've talked about some, we talked about powwowing a little bit. There's one other thing I'd like to pull out specifically that you know quite a lot about that uh, to talk to our viewers about, and that is one of the Pennsylvania Dutch's. Uh, I think the neatest or one of the neatest uh, aspects of our culture and traditions, and that's the bell snickel. Um, so this episode is going to be airing uh, in the middle of December. So we're, you know, we're in Christmas season. And um, early on, when Patrick started doing uh, demonstrations and, and started, you know, teaching, he started to portray the the bell snickel. So tell our listeners, because some people might only recognize the term from, of course, the famous office episode where Dwight oh, yeah, Troop yeah, yeah. dresses up as the as the quote unquote bell snickel. Um, but tell our listeners a little bit about that awesome Pennsylvania Dutch tradition. OK, so um, the bell snickel is a legendary character among the Pennsylvania Dutch who has been portrayed in a wide variety of ways. But usually he comes shortly before Christmas, sometimes closer to St. Nicholas Day, uh, which is actually the beginning of December, um, as opposed to uh, Christmas itself. But this is a Christmas visitor who's usually clad in furs. He's dirty. He's smelly. He's grouchy. Many times he brings gifts for the children, but that's kind of a secondary thing that he does. The primary thing is that he scares children, and usually he scares them into good behavior. So we're talking about a, a culturally distinct form of behavior modification that comes every year, sometimes in the form of a scary man dressed in furs who has birch switches in his hand, or some people remember him carrying a whip. Now, the best Belschnickels are the ones who can kind of shake things up a bit without actually having to use those switches or without having to use the whip. Um, I've portrayed the Belschnickel for, uh, I want to say it's, uh, it's about 10 years, um, give or take. Um, I think it might have been 2010 when I did it for the first time. So the interesting thing about this is um, over the years, I've put on the hides of animals, deer skins, all kinds of different things. I have antlers that are attached to my hat. I put on a, a big long wig, a grizzled wig with brown and gray hair and a big beard. Um, many times my face is smeared up so that I look like I'm, I'm covered in something dirty. And uh, the reality about the Belschnickel is that there's kind of this dual role that he plays. On one hand, um, Belschnickel means Nicholas in furs, or literally, if you take it apart, belts is the word for, for, for pelts or, or furs, and Nickel is the diminutive for Nick. But there's two Nicks that this could be referring to. It could be St. Nicholas, although St. Nicholas of Myrna, uh, being a Turkish saint, um, is very unlikely to be the origin of this particular character, except perhaps in name only, because um, St. Nicholas of Myrna was a, he was a, he was a bishop. Um, and uh, it's an interesting thing to see the difference between a Catholic bishop and the Belschnickel, who is this earthy, gritty, grimy dude. Other folks think that Nick is actually the old epithet for the devil. That old Nick was a way of referring to the uh, the kind of mischievous devil character that is found in old legends, usually trying people, tempting people, um, serving as the foil, really, to uh, to protagonists in stories um, mythologically from Europe. So this is an interesting character. He has this dual nature as perhaps saint, perhaps um, trickster, and uh, many times what he would do is he would show up to houses. Uh, locally, many times it was somebody's somebody's uncle who lived down the street. He put on a shabby outfit. Um, he would wear a furry hat or a furry cape or something like that. Come in with his switches and some candy. He would throw the candy on the floor. The kids would scramble for it, and he might he might threaten them with that stick, or he might give them a quick quick little tap. Um, the best Belschnickels were the ones who were, of course, not going to be hitting the children. But of course, previous generations, I'm not going to say it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Present day, instead, people people tend to look at this a little bit more humorously. The adults roar with laughter when the Belschnickel shows up because the kids think it's terrifying. 
And uh, once the kids see the Belschnickel maybe once or twice over the years, they also form this appreciation. They know that if they're good, they know that if they can kind of face their fears, speak to this fearsome character and uh, say something positive about what they've done over the course of the year, because the Belschnickel usually ask, have you been good? What did you do this year that was good? Um, you know, generally speaking, if the kid can stand up for themselves, say what they did that was a good thing, the Belschnickel might reward them. Um, but the kids who are wily or having some form of behavior issues, many times the Belschnickel kind of puts the fear into them so that hopefully they will be shaping up before Christmas comes because Belschnickel usually th threatens that if you, if you uh, aren't good before Christmas, I will come back. And uh, yeah. this is how I portray the Belschnickel each year. Yeah. It is one of my absolute favorite aspects of our culture, uh, and I and I think it's be, it has really gained a lot of po a popularity. I think recently, you know, over the last couple of years, um, as because it's such an iconic character, and people mm -hmm. that you know, we're talking about these people that are that are trying to reconnect with their family heritage or their Pennsylvania Dutch culture. And here's something that's very very easy to grab onto, um, and you see as you see him being portrayed in, in, in social media, in, you know, a, a TV, a mainstream TV show a couple of years ago, did an episode based on it. We mentioned about the office. So I, I mean, out of all of our Pennsylvania Dutch things that we could pull on, I just love the Belschnickel and, and the possibilities I think are endless with him as we, as we move forward in the future. Um, that, that's my personal opinion. I don't know if you see that or not. Um, kind of as a I, cultural I, ambassador for us in some way or another. I think we have many of these cultural ambassadors. The Belschnickel is one. The Groundhog is another. Yes. Uh, a lot of people don't know that the celebration that's taking place in Punxsutawney is ultimately inspired by traditions coming directly out of the, uh, the southeastern Pennsylvania hearth of the Pennsylvania Dutch culture. Um, so I think we have a number of these ambassadors. But I think that one of the things you're touching on here is that um, – Many people today, when they're interested in emphasizing some aspect of their culture or experiencing some aspect, there are performative aspects to these things. And so um, in the past, we may not have necessarily thought about this is who I am and this is what I do and this is why I do it. But today, especially, this is becoming increasingly important to people to explore those roots. And they do so through things that they can experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Belschnickel is just one of those many aspects of the region, I think, that just like you mentioned, a, a cultural ambassador of sorts, a character that people can really um, use as a, a as a way to get a better idea of the culture's values and the culture's aesthetics and and uh, what the culture thinks is funny, especially yeah. Yeah. humor goes along with all this. Yeah, absolutely. So, as the director of an open air museum like you are, or you know, learning center, what what makes your minus COVID take that out of the equation? What <laughs> makes your job difficult? Oh, well, I mean, there's a number of things. Um, one of the things I think that is difficult is helping, is the way we we have to constantly advocate for ourselves. Um, so the university, generally speaking, you know, is, is um, very much aware of our mission. Um, our faculty are very um, interested in what we're doing. Our students, when the teachers bring them down to our site for tours or for presentations or for events, um, they're engaged, they're interested, they think this is something unique, they see the value. Um, I think the hard part about it is many times people come in with some preconceived notions about what they're going to learn about. Um, and sometimes people, people assume, for instance, there's a lot of fallacies about the Pennsylvania Dutch. And mm. part of our role is to be able to provide a, an overview of the culture, give people an idea about the different traditions, um, but also to sometimes address different concerns that people have. And one of those concerns, for instance, is the idea that all the Pennsylvania Dutch are Amish or Mennonite. <laughs> well, in our area, we do have Mennonites. There are some Amish-owned businesses as well. Um, but generally speaking... Um, if you look at the history of Berks County, and at one point in time, Berks County was 75% German speaking. Um, those people, for the most part, were Pennsylvania Dutch or later waves of German Americans. Um, the, uh, the reality of this is that about 95% of the Pennsylvania Dutch in the 18th century, when the culture was first being founded, 95% of those people were part of what we would call the church, the church people. 
today, although um, I would argue that the Pennsylvania Dutch and Berks County are the descendants of the church people, because obviously things look a little bit different. Mm -hmm. uh, but originally, these were people who were part of the Lutheran and Reformed congregation. So there's this perception um, that all of us are Amish, and they come thinking they're going to see something relating to that experience. And you can't shake that notion from some people. Yeah. Um, the other side is that somehow or other, Pennsylvania Dutch um, is a term that is invalid. And so a lot of people will will come at us and say, you know, why are you calling yourselves Pennsylvania Dutch? We know that the Dutch are from Holland. You all didn't come from Holland. You all have your roots in Germany and Switzerland. You're wrong. The reality is they don't realize that the term Dutch historically had a much broader meaning. And if yep. you look it up in the Oxford English Dictionary, its meaning is very distinct. Its earliest usage meant German in a broader sense. So it included all the different families of German languages. So these kinds of things are often difficult. Um, there's also some stereotypes that plagued previous generations, and that is the dumb Dutch stereotype. This really had to do with the consolidation of schools in the 50s and 60s when a lot of rural one-room schoolhouses were being shut down. People were being brought into uh, consolidated uh, schools and were given remedial language lessons because they spoke with Pennsylvania Dutch accents or they were perceived to be less intelligent. Um, this has plagued the older generations. And this is part of the reason a lot of people lost their culture and their traditions is because they had this perception that their culture was inferior. And so you've got generations of people who decided it was not interesting to be Pennsylvania Dutch, and now they're interested in learning more about it. But in the meantime, the rest of the United States also bought into some of those ideas. Mm. So Pennsylvania Dutch is equated with what shall I say, quaint or kitsch instead of something that actually is, is a, a valid form of expression. And kitsch is great, um, but when people use words like folksy, folksy <laughs> and folk culture Folksy and folk cultural are two very different ideas. When you're talking about a folk culture, you're talking about something that really is the backbone of who a group of people are. It's the language, the food ways, the traditions they're holding on to. Folksy is the kind of stuff that um, generally people don't take overly seriously, that we would consider to be quaint yeah. or something that isn't isn't important in a, in a broader sense. So these right. are some of the challenges that we have. Um, but I would say that overall, um, we try to keep things positive. We don't try to be myth busters. Um, we don't try to uh, constantly um, correct people. We offer gentle um, reminders when people need them. But overall, it's up to us to tell our story. It's not up to other people to tell us what we should be, what we should be uh, doing. Instead, we, we do our best to emphasize the traditions that we know are exciting. Um, the arts of the Pennsylvania Dutch, for instance, are so stunning throughout the generations, and they've changed historically many, many times. Um, but when you take a look at, for instance, things like the decorated barns in the area, which I've had the pleasure of studying for well over, gosh, it's a, about 12 years now, I've been documenting the decorated barns in the area. This is a living tradition where people are painting circular geometric murals of stars on barns. Some people call them hex signs. Some people call them barn stars. Um, this is something that anybody can participate in this particular tradition. Um, you get people climbing ladders and painting them on historic structures. You get people painting them on items in the home. But this is really a tradition that's part of the Pennsylvania Dutch culture in some really important ways because it has grown and changed with the culture over the years. Um, these types of living traditions are very, very important to who we are and an important part of being able to experience the region no matter what culture you are from. And this is an important thing. It's part of the sense of place. And a sense of place is inclusive. And uh, that's why, for instance, when we open up our doors at the Heritage Center for a wide variety of different events over the years, um, we get people from all over. And folks love to come down and experience a little bit of the culture, taste the food, listen to the music, hear the language, look at the art, experience the spaces. Um, this is something that we're really proud to be able to participate in, um, being able to contribute to our sense of place in the region. If money wasn't an issue, what's one thing that you would really love to be able to do at the Heritage Center that you currently can't do? <laughs> Well, we, we are currently in the middle of a big project. Um, we are looking to get funding right now for a major library and archive. So part of the reason we need this is because we've done really well having the historic buildings there. But historic buildings are not buildings that are very well suited to storing and processing museum collections. <laughs> and our museum collection has outgrown the spaces that we have. 
And so we've got storage facilities in a couple different locations on campus in order to be able to store the materials that we have in areas that are both secure and, and are also going to be climate controlled for the most part. Um, but what we really need are spaces where this material can be accessed on a regular basis, um, not just by the staff as we work on these collections and interpret these collections and make sure that they're available to the public, but access for researchers, access to make sure that this collection is something that can be a real asset to grow the interest in the area, to grow the interest at the university, to forge new connections with different academic departments through the subject matter that is covered in our broad collection. So for me, I'm, I'm already kind of staring at this one objective that we currently have, which is to modernize our facilities in a sense. I don't mean modernize our historic buildings. I mean, get us a building that we can use as a modern research facility that meets all of our needs for professional spaces for research. And we're currently exploring a way to do this. So that's one thing. If money was no option, of course, I would love to expand the Heritage Center. Um, my predecessors at the Heritage Center, um, I'm the third director of the center, but the, uh, the first two directors had a vision that the center would continue to grow, that we would continue to acquire more buildings, that those buildings would be brought to the site and be preserved. This is an open air museum model that you find all throughout Europe. People will find a historic building that is significant. And if it's going to be taken down or if there's a reason why its location is not ideal to its preservation, it gets moved to these open air museums and gets incorporated into an authentic landscape that is created um, to allow people to experience um, different architectural treasures in their contexts. And I would love to get a church for the Heritage Center. Mm. Um, I would love to get um, additional buildings that would really help to fill out our story. Yeah, that would be awesome. I just As soon as you said that, I had a vision, you know, of, of knowing the cultural center the cultural centers like I do just seeing seeing a Pennsylvania Dutch style church there or or a meeting house or something like that I think that would be that would be a really awesome addition I mean Patrick, could you imagine if we had a place even like for instance say there was a church that was moved down there and there was a small cemetery plot I'm not saying you actually put people in there but we have examples of historic stones that are orphans right at various I mean I know churches where they've got they've got you know, gravestones stored away in basements because they have nothing, they have no space anymore for them outside. Hmm. I've known numbers of these, um, and I'm not going to mention which congregations, but this is an interesting situation. And so to me, um, you know, when I see um, various museum collections having things like this, um, I think it would be an amazing thing for us to really try to comprehensively portray all of the different cultural spaces, secular and sacred, that really kind of forge the uh, the cultural ties to our sense of place. Yeah. Yeah, that, that you're right. You're absolutely right. Patrick, I've known you a long time. And the one thing that always has impressed me about you is that you have a work ethic and a drive like very few people I've ever met in my life. Where does that come from? <laughs> oh, I don't really know. Um, I so I, I I got my first job before I was thirteen. Um, I worked on a farm for a little while, um, actually all throughout my junior high school and high school. I lived in Southern York County at that point in time. My father uh, is a Lutheran minister. He actually just retired. Um, and uh, his first call was at a, a little town called Felton, Pennsylvania, in southern York County. And uh, I worked on a farm there uh, as a kid. And uh, I did all kinds of things. And I just, I, from a very early on age, I realized, like, oh, I can make my own money. Wow, this is really interesting. So when I was a kid, my parents didn't need to constantly give me money for things all the time because, well, frankly, I. I, I found ways of doing that. Um, I also sold some artwork when I was in high school. So I was, I was kind of a little entrepreneurial. Um, and this is something that I uh, appreciated about the idea that hard work leads to results. And sometimes they're monetary, like what I learned very early on, but many times they're not. Many times it, it, it takes finding something you love to essentially demonetize and decommodify it so what you're starting to, uh, to, um, to gain from doing the work you love is magnifying things like the things that inspire you, 
it just kind of multiplies. When you get inspired about something and you follow your dreams and you follow your hopes and you learn and you make the learning process part of your creative life, it's something that continues to multiply. And so for me, the more I work, the more excited I get about what I do. It's part of a creative habit that I've been nurturing. Um, I've written several books and some of them, some of them were harder to birth than others, but um, I stuck with it. Um, I've, I've really, I think, I, I probably can't take credit for these qualities. This is something that kind of came natural to me in the sense of wanting to work hard on things. Um, but I think my parents had a huge, huge part in that process. Um, my, both of my parents are very hardworking people. Um, and I also think there was this... Uh, <laughs> Uh, this thing I remember just as a kid, uh, my, my dad was studying philosophy in college when I was uh, in early elementary school. And I remember phrases like learning to delay gratification <laughs> being used at the dinner table when I was like maybe in first grade. So like these ideas that like to be able to get what you really want out of life, sometimes things are going to be hard. Sometimes you have to work hard. Sometimes you have to change locations. Um, my dad went through seminary when I was in, in elementary school. I, I got to see firsthand what it looked like for my dad to learn Greek uh, in order to be able to study the New Testament and things like that. These are not easy things to do, and uh, but they're rewarding things. And so for me, there was a, you know, there's a, there was a sense that I watched the people that I loved around me work hard to achieve the things that they, uh, um, that they wanted to achieve. And my mother was so devoted to our family. My, my mother um, worked uh, at colleges. She worked at Lebanon Valley College and then worked at uh, Gettysburg College for a little while, um, almost always worked in the education area. Um, and uh, I got to see how much she supported our family and how hard she worked to do that, even when me and my brother sometimes took that for granted growing up. Mm. So I think really when you have two hardworking parents who are devoted to what they do, who are devoted to their family and can show what they've worked on and why they've worked on it. I think that's a really important thing. And it's inspiring. Uh, yeah, you are, you are absolutely correct. You are absolutely correct on that. Well, Patrick, we end every interview with 10 questions. Um, <laughs> so we've, we're done talking shop. Let's have a little fun. Okay. Are you ready? <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm going to do what I can. That's all we ask. Question number one, what is your morning drink of choice? Coffee. How do you take your coffee? Black. Yeah. Schwarz and Schottisch. Yeah. Yeah. Black and strong. That's right. Okay. What is or who is a go to musical artist or group for you? <laughs> Let me think right now. Hmm. Well, I don't want to think about it too hard. Right now, JP Harris. I'm going to give a shout out to one of my absolute favorite country artists for a long okay. time country was kind of something that was not so interesting to me and i've found a number of country artists recently that i really appreciate i love folk music and uh, i really appreciate jp harris my uh, lovely wife becca introduced me to jp harris and i'm hooked sounds good well everybody out there there's a new a new artist maybe for some of you guys to check out too uh number three what is a movie that you can watch over and over again and it never gets old <laughs> Oh, man. Um, well, I think when I was younger, it was Princess Bride. I have to oh, say that excellent film 400,000 times. I used to put <laughs> it on as background music when I would do things. <laughs> That's a great answer. It is. It's a great film, too. Absolutely. Uh, what is the this will be curious. Uh, number four. What is the last thing that you read? Oh, um, well, so do audiobooks count or does it have to be? A sure. Specific? No, absolutely. It could be audio. The last sure. thing was Cynthia Bourgeau's book called um, Mary Magdalene. And uh, it was an interesting um, theological work, um, mystical work on taking a look at the non-canonical and legendary aspects of Mary Magdalene. And uh, I really like Cynthia Bourgeau. She is a wonderful author, especially one who examines some lesser known aspects of Western religion and mm -hmm. uh, presents them in ways that you just would not think of. And uh, that, I'm a person that, who appreciates uh, um, religious theory, theology, and many other different aspects of yeah. the culture. So that sounds like something I need to I need to look at. That sounds really really interesting. Really interesting. It, yeah, and it's it's a it's a her works are are oftentimes building upon the mystical tradition. So okay, okay. 
All right, number five, what's your favorite pizza topping? Oh, well, um, it, can I only pick one or do I have to pick? Uh, no, you can, no, you can name them. Go ahead, Patrick. Okay. So I normally do, I like onions, green peppers, mushrooms, and bacon. Yeah, that sounds like a good combination for sure. It's delicious. <laughs> Number or six. some broccoli on there too. Sometimes. Oh, there you go. There you go. Laying on the beach or going for a hike? Hiking. Sounds good. You have invited me over for dinner. What are you making? Well, um, if it were up to me, the first thing that comes to my mind is I'd make you some Thai mala. Oh, yeah. I'd make you some pig stomach. I yeah. love making that. And you know what? Nobody in my family eats it. But if you came over, I would make it for you, Doug, because I'm pretty sure you probably like pig stomach. Yes, we would We would dig in. That's for sure. Absolutely. Yes, 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 yes. Sounds delicious. Number eight, what is a dream vacation destination of yours? Oh, wow. Well, um, let me think about that. <sighs> So if it were just me, if it were only just me, I think I would probably go to some really fabulous library and archive in Europe. Okay. But if it were with my whole family, it would probably be somewhere outside. If it were uh, with my wife, it would probably have hot springs in, involved somewhere out west, places to hike around. Um, so yeah, those are my two answers. Sounds good. Sounds good. What is something that you're afraid of? Oh, huh. Good question. Hmm. I don't know. I don't think about that too often. <laughs> That's okay. So the, oh, okay, the, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. And yeah, go a, ahead. This is a, this is a, this, you're going to laugh at this. So I have a hard time with heights. Oh, and yet, and yet you can yet, climb up a ladder and on a facade of a barn, feet and feet up in the air, and, and then you're okay. And you know why I'm so safe when I'm up on a ladder? Why? Because there are times where it's very uncomfortable. Uh-huh. And you know what? When you're uncomfortable, you take every step seriously. You're meticulous about what you do. You watch yeah. where your tools are at all times. And, uh, and, and I have never become fully comfortable in high places. And you know what? It's something I do all the time, yeah. but it's something that is still uncomfortable. So there hmm. you go. That's a good answer. That's a good. I never would have guessed that. Last question. What job other than the one that you have now or have had in the past, would you love to have? Oh, man. Um, uh, a bookbinder. Someone oh. who specializes in historic bindings. I do this. On the side, when no one is looking, <laughs> I love to take, I, I have I have a lot of old books, and some of them need rehabbing. I have been working on being able to replace, um, you know, reback and re, you know, uh, um, and do a number of different things to um, old leather volumes that I have, and to do so archivally, um, to make yeah. sure that they will last. And I, I love the process. I love books, and I love especially examining old bindings and recreating them. That's cool. Yeah. Plus, it smells good the whole time you're working on it, too. Uh, right? sometimes, sometimes. Sometimes. Not all materials <laughs> smell good. But, but yes, if you find an old book that has a wonderful odor, that is, that, is, that, is a, that is part of its history. It's part of how it's experienced. Yeah. Well, Patrick, thank you so much for coming on and having this little talk with me. I mean, you, you and I could sit and talk for hours. Um, but uh, I think it's important that uh, I got the listeners the opportunity to learn a little bit about the Cultural Heritage Center. I'll put a link in the show notes for people to check out the website. And as Patrick mentioned, they have multiple, well, when COVID isn't happening or we're not in a pandemic, they usually have three major events throughout the year where people are invited to uh, Christmas on the farm, Easter on the farm, and their, their Haymet Fest their homecoming type festival and you can always catch patrick at the kutztown folk festival hopefully this year uh 2021 will allow us to have it we'll just have to wait and see um but the work that you do patrick uh you has a has a value way beyond the paycheck that you take home you are doing work that will last for generations and telling our story and making sure that my children my grandchildren your grandchildren will have this opportunity to 
continue to learn about our culture and our place and every aspect that is Pennsylvania Dutch. And I can't thank you enough for the work that you've done and all of the work that you'll continue to do in the future. So thank you for being a good friend. Thank you for coming on here. And I look forward to, of course, working with you in the future as well. And uh, I'll get some people to come visit you. That's for sure. Well, thank you so much, Doug. It's an honor to be here on the show with you. You're a person who has also a ton of energy and passion for the culture. I consider you such an important ally in the work that we're doing. And uh, it's always a pleasure just to catch up and have a good conversation, too. Isn't it? I agree. I agree. (laughs) So thanks again. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks for listening to Doug's Front Porch, a conversational podcast with your host, Doug Maidenford. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Follow along on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just look for at Doug's Front Porch. And please tell all your friends about the show, and I'll see you all next time on My Front Porch. 